my name is Nicole, and our question is for Michelle. Um, as a patient and survivor, uh, your program sounds absolutely phenomenal, but our question really was, is there anything that a patient can do to sort of help other patients? Is this a position or a program that really only an RN or an oncology nurse um, can really help other patients with? Is there some way to navigate um, with other patients to kind of be you know, partners with them side by side and say, I've done this, here's what you can expect, I'd love to be I'd love to be utilized in a way to give back what I've gained just from being a patient going through treatment. Absolutely, there's a victim in the audience. <laughs> my, my, you gotta raise your hand, MJ, because her, her and I have been walked her journey for six years, and when she completed her treatment, she said, there's a way I wanna give back, and I'm like, you're really sorry you said that to me, because um, she is now, helps me co-do my support group, she is part of a Breath of Hope Lung Foundation, which was a funded, we started the first Lung Cancer Watch Walk in Minneapolis. That was um, five years ago, 400 people first year, and we went over 2,000 this year. Gave over $100,000 to research from just our little walk. That's awesome. And uh, good old MJ has uh, been, uh, said, you know, how do I give back? And I do, I, I tell my patients all the time, powers are in, our numbers and talking to each other and I and I and I do lung cancer so um, they feel that there's not a voice and that I'm now expanding it to other malignancies but definitely that ability to empower each other and I tell patients all the time this is not that I'm walking with you in your journey and I can help you but this is your journey so I'm giving you the tools and you have to choose whether you're, you're ready for them or not so I, yeah, I mean, I, it truly is. And I think um, you don't realize how powerful you guys are. I mean, how powerful and how much, honestly, I am I'm a rogue person in Walmart when there's crabby people. And that's because of people like you. Because I'm like, you know what? Come to work with me for, for a half an hour and you'll realize what really you can be, excuse my French, pissed off about. <laughs> Okay. So, yes, to answer your question, and, okay. and MJ can give you the feedback. I'm Marguerite Broussard, and I'm in active treatment, and we and our table have been talking about how much we adore our doctors, nurses, and PAs, mm -hmm. yet um, how can we, there is nothing going on at our treatment center like this, and we strongly recognize the need for that, and how can we encourage and support our treatment center in moving in that direction? Um. Well, one thought is to let them know, let them know that other things are going on and that, uh, boy, it would be helpful to not only you, but everyone else who walks through that door, you know, to have these tools, many of them which could be online, uh, could be resources, uh, and you could be an advocate. You could say, you know, can we help bring a, and build a, a library, both a virtual and a paper library of survivorship booklets, tools, organizations, and be an advocate for your site. I think that'd be hard to turn down. Okay. My name is Venus Ginez. Buenos dias. Uh, my question is really to all of you. Have you considered integrating community health workers and promotores and in native communities? It's called community health uh, representatives. This is a new movement. It's already built in in the Affordable Care Act. These are people in the community, trusted members in the community, many who are cancer survivors, who can be trained in developing some skills on communication, advocacy, uh, you know, teaching skills, organization skills, but more importantly, they can be trained on how to develop uh, survivorship plans. And I was wondering if you've even thought about that. I know Minnesota has a community health worker network. And here in Texas, we have to boast about Texas. Yes. Uh, uh, Texas was the first state to implement a state-sponsored training program and certification for community health workers and promotoras. And it's making a real impact in our community. So. Uh, just really quickly, I, I went, I got lucky, one of the oncologists who used to work at the U was from Hawaii and went back home and asked me to go to Maui and work with the community workers there. So just by you saying that as awareness, because I don't think people realize the, the resources that are out there with community workers. And we built a navigation system, not in the hospital, but with the community workers on patient navigation. So kudos, and I think, the more you can share about that information is invaluable. The, um, I'm a member of the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas, 
and that is a fantastic for other states if you don't have a network like this you know what it was it was women getting together and saying there isn't enough resources for our sisters out there and this was some five six years ago and they're now establishing an online portal of information of one places where you can go if you don't have insurance resources referrals etc and uh, the probatoris via Baylor uh, it was an excellent presentation last year so just within that forum in Texas that information about an incredible program you know was disseminated through people throughout the healthcare system so thank you for your work okay uh, I could answer briefly. Venus, I'd like to learn more about that. In Colorado, there is a series mm -hmm. of uh, community health clinics that primarily serve uh, a Hispanic population in the state. They're called the Salud Health Clinic System. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know if perhaps maybe they have funding that could, could uh, be supplemental to what we do within our cancer network. Hi, I'm Lori Holleran Steiker. Sorry, I'm a social work professor at UT Austin and a breast cancer survivor. Uh, just finished chemo in June, so it's very, very recent stuff for me. But um, I was just having a conversation with Kim, the life coach, in the hallway getting my hot chocolate. And um, I think the thing that's coming up for me that's my biggest challenge that I wonder if you could speak to is um, I'm a bit of a care caretaker myself, uh, if you might imagine. And um, so one of my coping mechanisms was to make sure that everybody around me knows I'm okay. And I did a lot of that on automatic pilot through the whole treatment. But when uh, I was told that I was in remission, I had kind of a tsunami of emotions yes. come over me. Wow. And I didn't have the experience where everything was beautiful and made sense. I had the experience of, what the F is this about? You know, and um, I think a lot of it was that I was on automatic pilot for that whole year, and there's an aftermath. But my family and friends are celebrating. I mean, right. they are done, That's right. and I am just starting. And so I come across as irritable and discontent and restless and icky, um, and they don't know what to make of that, so they say, oh, that's the tamoxifen. Oh, that's menopause, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's not like there's even space to process it. So I wonder how families can be educated I don't want to be the one dragging my husband into therapy like no. that. He has enough going on, you know, that we have three adolescents and whatnot. But how can we engage family and friends to understand this survivor, this, this survivorship piece, this, you know, uh, what did some, somebody called it, you know, your, you know, the... Uh, the new, what was? The new normal. New normal. The new like normal. How, uh, like, I never heard that concept. Oh, okay. At, before this, thank God I have, but how do we help family and friends with juncture? When you finish treatment, you do just sort of implode. You're walking around in a body that's no longer yours. Your mind isn't working the same way. Guess what? They just came out with some research that said chemo brain is real. And uh, I actually did drag my husband to therapy. <laughs> you have to, to um, take care of yourself first, that what you're experiencing is very normal. They see it, and, and perhaps Michelle can address how she sees and helps families come back together. Well, I'm going to say, first of all, post-traumatic stress is real. Yeah. yeah. And and I tell patients, just like, okay, so the best example is I had a patient that used to wear her hope button when it was a good day, and her, her cancer effing sucks on the bad days. And she was back in chemo when she completed, and she handed the buttons over to somebody who was having severe post-traumatic stress. And she goes, wear the cancer effing sucks button right now and tell your family, you're, you're processing. You were, you're a health professional, so you, you go into the chance that you're, um, you're like, I can't do anything but move forward. I'm moving forward, I'm moving forward, then wham, it stops. And you're like, now, now what, the, what do I do? And sometimes you just have to accept it yourself 
Sometimes you need to go find somewhere you can scream bloody murder. I mean, scream bloody murder. Oh, let me add two comments of uh, recognition and, uh, and perhaps a solution. Um, I, I wrote an essay that was published in the Clinical of Oncology, uh, the Journal of Clinical Oncology two years ago in, in an essay that's called The State of the Art of Oncology. And in that I recognized at the end of active treatment, physicians in particular, but oftentimes oncology providers, kind of drop that patient and say, you're done with treatment now and we'll see you in three months. And that patient is like falling through a black hole. And I recognize that, having seen that in my career, and, and it's a very painful thing that we don't do a good enough job with. And it's a terrible thing. And don't get caught up in the diagnosis. I, 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 mean, I, I mean this in that all the tumor subset have phenomenal resources. Forget your label. Look at the ovarian group. Look at the lung cancer group. Look at the breast cancer group. Mm -hmm. We gotta forget our labels because everybody's got phenomenal resources. Don't put yourself I tell my lung cancer patients, you know what? Start looking at what the breast cancer people do because you know what? They have advocated for themselves. Get on their website, see what they're doing, see what their resources are. Don't label yourself right. Just that you're other. limited to your diagnosis and what the resources are. Mm -hmm. Don't do it because you can learn from each other sure. and there's phenomenal stuff out there. Okay, we have time for one more question in the back here. Uh, I'm Diana Jeffrey, I'm a health psychologist and I live about a mile from the Capitol, which is, should explain my next question. Who's gonna pay for this? I mean, I listened to your comment, Michelle, about taking three hours in order to really assemble a very good treatment summary. And since um, some years ago when the Institute of Medicine put out a report about cancer survivorship, and in the back of it had some models of, of cancer treatment plans, the question was asked, who's gonna pay for the amount of time it takes to assemble these and also to get them in the right hands as well. It's one thing to design these care plans and the other is to be able to communicate them effectively to PCPs. So I wondered what the panel's experience has been with that kind of question. If, if I could take the first approach to that, uh, I think my organization that I'm founding and I'd like your help with uh, is gonna save money and won't cost. Um, my thought is if we can summarize and have available to primary care providers an understanding of breast cancer and the standards of follow-up, how many fewer PET scans, how many fewer MRI scans, how many fewer bone scans and CAT scans won't be done that don't need to be done, that are done needlessly at great cost to society, and we'll be, we'll be removing those scanning costs and if we can help patients be less anxious about their diagnosis, maybe as a level of anxiety, they won't be going to their doctors looking for the next PET scan because they have fear of their cancer having come back three months from their last treatment. So I, I hope that in the system that we're building, which will be free to everyone, virtual online, that it will reduce healthcare costs without a cost to society. In our visits, the the fact that people sit down with us for an hour and really kind of put their arms around and kind of identify them to resources. We've seen our nurse calls go down our time because we're being more proactive, like really actively. I, I think there's probably a lot of people in the room that would say, at diagnosis, me and I was lost and I didn't know where to go. How do you give them resources, connect them right there, like to minimize the phone calls, the side effect management, all of that. We've actually seen our numbers go down. so. I think that's the big thing that we need to find outcomes that we're measuring and that we're, we're reporting that this is valuable, people need it, it's improving quality and it's decreasing our, our healthcare costs. 